Welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are peeling back the wine business one cork, one label, one bottle at a time. And today we have a very special guest. Brandon Sparks Gillis is in from the Dragon at Cellars. And we're going to hear a fascinating story. However, uh, this program is sponsored, of course, by the original Wine of the Month Club, where they are sporting the Pure Wine Club, where we send you biodynamic and organic wines direct to your door. But the first thing I got to say, Brandon, is welcome, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me. But Michelle McHugh, she says hi. That's is that, a is blast that, from the past. The That's from amazing. The past? Yeah, she says somewhere say like, a, <laughs> <laughs> like a very distant past. Wow. So I was looking for uh, somebody. You know, I've struggle through digital marketing it's uh, very not struggled but just headwinds all the time right and the main headwind you probably relate to this is the wine business is misunderstood by most marketeers they don't understand it yep and i ran to michelle at a big event at trebecchieri and we had this great conversation and now she's my pr lady that's great so, small small world. isn't that funny so she says <laughs> and then she says we'll get to this later talk about the uh, happy uh, canyon ava but well, we'll talk about that yeah. later i'm not sure what, <laughs> what she meant by that <laughs> So anyway, I, this is a very interesting conversation because um, I'm actually today supposed to be in Hermosa Beach, which apparently is where you made your first. That is the proto Dragonette era. The, yes. Yeah, so, what part of Hermosa Beach was this? Uh, John would actually be able to tell you the exact location. It was yeah. off Morningside, and I forget the cross oh, street. Yeah. But basically, right <laughs> on the corner of Manhattan and Hermosa, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like around the border. Yeah. Okay, seriously, that's where I lived. I lived at three three two First Street in Manhattan, which is that border <laughs> street on that's, Morningside. <laughs> you might have you might have actually wa wandered Who past knows? our garage knows, with right? a barrel in it it's at some so point. Funny. That's yeah, very small world. So I, we, I jumped ahead at the court of the history of uh, of Dragonette, but tell us about your. Uh, and we have so many things to comment. I don't know if we're going to have enough time to talk about it because my daughter's a baking chef, and it sounds like that's where you started your career, so to speak. Yeah, I, I studied geology thinking I was going to be a geologist. Well, that's a departure. Which yeah. circled back, and I'm happy to be using it now uh, on the vineyard soil yeah, side. Sure. <laughs> but uh, when I was studying geology, I had the great fortune to be selected for a project where I spent a summer in Italy. And for me, this was between junior and senior year in college and like a lot of people in america i grew up in a, a pretty basic suburb in a in a family who my mother was a fantastic cook but there was no wine culture within our family mm. and so what i had, had uh, this was in a suburb of seattle, seattle in the northwest okay. yeah and when i went to italy I, had, I, had, I was going to school in walla walla at the time so i had, had sort of began to learn a little bit about wine just by proximity there and a fun budding wine region but when I went to Italy, that was where, for me, everything came into focus. I mean, I saw the way that grain was grown and then used by the little local village baker, and I saw the way that the grapes were grown, and it was Verdicchio. I was near Castello di Iesi. Oh, wow. And, you know, the, the way that the, that whole culture merged, and I saw food uh, and wine as being something that was really made for each other at the table, something that I hadn't really seen culturally uh, in my own upbringing. And so I came back uh, from that project. You know, I, I went there thinking I was going to go to grad school in geology. And I came back, finished up my geology degree, and said I really need to do something in food and wine. Yeah. And it just so happened that I, I found work uh, as an artisan baker. And that was something that I pursued off and on for about a decade. And wow. had a, a really, really fantastic mentor who had trained in France and introduced me to all the wonders of native yeast and uh, bread, you know, wild ferments. And as I was... A baker, I was you know, reading everything I get my hands on. You know, Kermit Lynch's Adventures on the Wine Route was a really huge inspiration for me and on the wine side. And so I was learning about wine while I was working as a baker and quickly saw the parallels in terms of certain parts of the production process. And of course, you know, the way that they work together. I mean, Where were bread, you cheese, and wine. I uh, started at a bakery in Sun Valley, a place called Bigwood Bread, yeah. which is actually still there under different ownership. And then the same friend, my mentor, established a bakery in Durango, Colorado, and took me out there. And so, so you think uh, I'm going to kind of hit some of these points because there's so many things that we could talk about. It. We're not going to get all of it, but you know, my daughter's a baker. She was trained in France. She worked at a Paris bakery. She worked. She went to Alain de Casa school. She she bakes in New York now for Chef ben, Jonathan Benno at Leonelli and Benno. And you know that is a such a passionate business. And I can see now it carries over to the wine side. Certainly chemically it does, and you know through the exchange of molecules and things, but the physiology and the psychology to be a baker it's you have to love it don't you you do <laughs> i mean to get up what three in the morning and go yeah there was certain times where i'd be yeah I'd be preparing for a busy weekend i'd go to work at midnight or one in the morning and there was a period where i was kind of doing a transitional thing at that durango time i'd work at the bakery in durango from 
some point in time in the crack of dawn, I would typically get off around 11 or noon, drive over to a vineyard in Cortez, uh, Sutcliffe Vineyards out yeah, in Colorado. Sure, yeah, I remember that. And uh, work there in the afternoon. And so I was kind of wow. burning the candle at both ends. But I really loved the way that had obviously a massive passion for both sides. Yeah. But just at a certain point in time, wine won out, and that's actually what brought me out to California. So 10 years as a baker, and then you were a cellar rat, so to speak, or a vineyard rat, or whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, I was doing the, the cellar rat thing while simultaneously while being a baker, and then reached a point where I had, had seen sort of the basics in the vineyard and then the cellar, but realized that I always had an interest in actually being part of the process in terms of you know having a label that I was a part of. And I realized that before I did that, I really needed to tune my palate up. Yeah. And so I had the opportunity. I ended up moving from Colorado to take a job at Wally's of all places. Yeah. <laughs> so, and my first day on the job at well Wally's, known. yeah, John Dragonette was the closing manager. And so we just, we hit it off very That's quickly. That's amazing. Yeah, I did very random. I mean, completely different backgrounds. He was taking a sabbatical from the law. And we just found that we had very, very similar palates. And during that era, over a few years' time, had the ability to taste far and wide from great everyday wines sure. to some of the icons of the world. It was still the, the time, and I think actually it's almost a generational gap now, where you know we would go to tastings, and I'm sure you remember this, where we'd taste all the first growth. So you'd taste DRC. Oh, yeah, you'd, was, you'd taste these wines that are now yeah, they can't touch them, right? in the sure. Unicorn Club and, and are pretty much untouchable. So yeah. we, I mean, we had a really great education that way. Uh, in addition to obviously the, the kind of mastery of retailing and all that. So and the Wally's, you know, I'll tell you how I do it. I have, I could not survive this business without specifying the days that I'm allowed to taste. For one reason, the sales guys would be all over me every day. Mark would be in here every 15 minutes bugging me, phone calls, emails, whatever. Because probably weren't emails back then, but so I taste on Tuesdays. I start at nine thirty. There's an online calendar, fortunately, and I stop at two thirty, and that's it. I taste probably fifty to sixty wines. Fifty two last Tuesday. Do they do that at Wally's? How do they how do they handle that? Uh, this, you must have traffic wine guys coming all the time. Yeah, it's bombarded. I mean, it's obviously yeah, one of the iconic shops. And yeah. when we were there, this is a long time ago now, but when we were there, there was you know a buyer's office, and I had the good fortune to work closely with Gary Fishman, who's yeah, no sure. longer there, but. Um, he would taste they would set parameters you know so there'd be certain days certain hours uh, but it was when you look at the buying teams there the, there was activity happening almost every day of the week yeah. and oh, yeah. a lot of <laughs> a lot of great wine coming through there so i mean right. even just being able to pick up scraps like we did i mean it was just a really fantastic opportunity i think marco greedy you probably see it already being on that side of the business that it's gotten very congested lately and there's just tons of stuff out there but there okay is. so you 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 were uh you after your Sutcliffe winery, then when did you get a full-time job in a winery to do something? So after spending a few years at Wally's, after Wally's yeah. the, the garage days were within that same zone. So in the year 2003, we ended up, uh, John Falcone, uh, a great winemaker up in the San Inez area, helped us locate a little bit of backyard Syrah in 2003. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we picked this little patch of Syrah, made that barrel in Hermosa Beach, uh, the next year, we got a little more serious and got a custom crush arrangement up in Santa Maria. But in 03 and 04, it was really just an R&D phase for us. We were yeah. just sort of experimenting. We found that we really liked the process. John's brother, Steve, joined in as well, and we found that we really had just a complementing set of skills between the three of us. So John was the first to leave the wine shop, and he went off and apprenticed with Kathy Joseph of Fiddlehead, you know, yeah. one of the pioneers in the sure. Santa Rita Hills, and in Happy Canyon. And so he was. He worked as a cellar rat there uh, for a year, and then spent a couple of years in the vineyards, working for Coastal Vineyard Care, the great vineyard management company that manages now kind of the lion's share of the vineyard throughout the San Ynez Valley. And I stayed out of the shop for about another year, and then went and worked a vintage uh, with Torbreck down in the Barossa. Mm -hmm. and wow, then, you went to Australia. Yeah. So for me, I John was focusing on Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc, and we we already had this idea of you know which varieties we were interested in working with, and so it was a bit strategic that. I wanted to focus on Syrah and Grenache on the sort of Rhone varietal side. So worked a vintage at Torbrek and then that very same year came back and worked a vintage with Manfred Crankle at Sinequinon. And then had the good fortune to meet uh, our great friend Mike Roth, who he, at the time he was the winemaker at Demetria Estate mm -hmm. up in San Inez. Remember. And when my time at Sinequinon wound down, uh, Mike was in need of an assistant winemaker and so I came on full time there. Uh, that would have been early 2007. How, you know, I interviewed winemakers from all over the world, fourth growth, second growth, uh, even associated with Lafitte. So how important, and I see this all the time, that bouncing around the world, getting experience in different parts of the world. So some will go to Australia, many go to Argentina, many go to France, obviously. Is, is that a 
a holistic view of the wine business by doing that that it, the experience you get by producing wine in the Barossa Valley lend itself to a, a better look at doing it yourself when you come back without a doubt and I think that's something that I always recommend to people who are getting into it I say take advantage of that and I mean there's sort of a, a global route especially with the t two different harvests in the different hemispheres within one year mm -hmm. I think that it's amazing to get a chance to travel and I think travel on all of our sides right I mean if you're going and tasting wine at the domain in France or in Spain or in Italy or something sure. I mean the, the perspective that you get by traveling is always fantastic and one of the things about doing harvests in other parts of the world is you'll also end up it's not just so much going to that one place which is a fantastic immersion into that but in, in my time in the Barossa I worked with about a dozen other interns from all around the world oh really so, I mean, so you had a yeah, camaraderie you're, you're, with people you're in the same spectrum. And, and to this day, I mean, one of my good friends, Aaron Pick, he's a master of wine. He was the first master of wine in Israel. And really? <laughs> yeah, he's a winemaker in Israel now. And then so there's there's a network that becomes established that I think, I think that has, I think it's shaped global wine quality in the sense of having, and you see it now too, where you have over time traditionally you know particularly in old world regions there was a tradition of almost always working kind of within the own with your own backyard that's or within right. your own family yeah, for sure and there's a depth there that's really phenomenal and amazing and something that i think there's a heritage there that's unbeatable but when you get a generation the next generation has the chance to travel around the world and see how things are done in a completely different way or in a similar way but just in a different location it lends so much perspective i think that that's one of the things that's caused I mean, the average quality of wine globally to just skyrocket in recent decades. I think that traveling is a big part of it. I, th I, I would agree with that completely. And the, the passion that comes through here, as, as you obviously have, um, is expressed in different ways. Yeah. And we'll, we're going to peel some of that back with some of this conversation about biodynamic organic wines. But clearly, um, this business requires a love of the vine and the soil. And you were talking about your friend, the, uh, the master of wine from Israel, uh, and you you passed the part of the test already. Yeah, I passed theory last year, yeah. and then just took the practical exam in June. Did so you really? I'll find out in That's September. That's the tasting side. Yeah. So I just applied. Awesome. Yeah, That's I just fantastic. applied. It, it's it's kind of strange. I've said this a few times uh, to uh, on camera, but the, my absolute desire to pursue more knowledge on this subject is something relatively new. It's like the last couple of years, and it might be because of interviewing people with your passion and, and wine makers from all the world that had the same passion. But now I'm hell bent on figuring this thing out, and uh, I do have the fortunate op opportunity here that I taste so much wine, right? That'll I've be a huge advantage. Ninety thousand wines, so I, yeah. now I have to brown bag them, right? <laughs> Which is a whole different side of it. I mean, that is one of the things. Right? Brown tasting is the ultimate humbler. So, who was he your sponsor then for the? I uh, know uh, Amy Christine, who you might know through Kermit Lynch uh, down in this area, and she yeah, and her husband yeah, yeah. have Black Sheep Farms. Yeah, yeah, they do yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, she was the one who really. I mean, I had, Aaron went through the process, and I, I saw that happen. At the time, we had kind of hoped to go into it together, but at the time, Dragonette was just too busy. I didn't have the time to devote to the studying. And when the kind of, kind of came a time that allowed me to have a little bit more uh, time that way, Amy was just a, a huge support, still is to this day, but I mean, yeah, years? she was the one who got me in. Um, I'm going on my fourth year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Peter Koff was in here, and Peter Koff's a South African uh, he's importer. Great. He's Legend. a great guy. He yeah. was great conversation on camera. You should listen to that podcast. It just came out I've got last it queued Tuesday. up. Yeah. yeah. Really great guy. We have, we could, that could have been two hours easily. We, yeah. we always hit it off. Because he's on the business side too. But we were talking about David Lake being, at the time when David Lake was making wine in Washington, he was like the only master of wine making wine. So there's more then. There is a few more. I mean, it's actually, it's, it's, it's interesting. The Institute does a tasting, I don't know if it's annually or every couple of years where they get people together and it's great. You, know, you have makers. Michael from Kumu River down in New yeah, Zealand, right. Drew Noon from Noon Winery in McLaren Vale, yeah. Olivier Humbrecht, I mean, from Zint Humbrecht. I mean, you look at it and it's a very small club, but a, a, a Morgan from Bedrock is in yeah, that right, now. And yeah. I mean, it's Amy from Joy Fantastic. I mean, it really, it's an incredible group of people. And to me, it's really inspiring. So one of the questions I had from was like the difference in Master Sama. I had Emmanuel Kamiji in here, who's a, who's a making wine in Pure Rat, also Santianez, uh, and he's a wine making uh, Master Sama. So we were discussing the differences. But so I took this test, uh, I took the hour and a half Fortunately, although I think I could have answered all three questions of an hour and a half's worth of essay, but one of them was about the future of packaging of wine. And I know packaging of wine, like, well, there's stuff that a lot of people don't know from the 80s that, that I know. So uh, that was very easy. But then they, there were those four, four bottles of wine and compare and contrast to two Pinot Grigios, compare and contrast to dessert wines. That one I'm not... <laughs> 
<laughs> I wait to see. And I know that they're going to evaluate and make recommendations. Anyway, fascinating. Uh, gl- glad to meet you at that level because that's exciting. And I'm glad that you're starting the journey. It's, it's, it's such a great community, and I think it's just great to see the you know, the United States now, there's more students in the U.S. than in any other country, and I think that's kind yeah. of a badge of honor to kind of see that many people engaging at that high of a level. Because yeah, I think that's one of the things is that the whole community, whether it's students to the MW level, there really is an incredible group of people. And, and like you say, I mean, it, we all share that common passion. And what is that? I even, st- I even bought a book on rocks and then you studied rocks. I was wondering, was that the Alex Maltman book? Yes, like, I just <laughs> got it about halfway through it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, my parents would say, what are you doing? That's not who you are. Why it inspires us though? I think <laughs> yeah, that's I the thing. Know. And they, there's very few things when you think about that on earth that would inspire us to go to that level of granularity to yeah, get literally to down into rocks. the soil. Yeah. <laughs> so. But it's fun. I mean, and I think that's one of the things that brings us back. I mean, I know for us, that's been a huge inspiration in terms of what we're doing in the vineyards, you know, has been looking at, you know, what's unique about Santa Barbara and how can we highlight that and geology, the this rocks, it, the soils. Right? I mean, that's, to. that's the fundamental part of it. So the, the dragon is sellers then it's, uh, the two brothers yes. and yourself. Yep. Mm-hmm. Is there a facility there? There is, yeah. We okay. have our own production facility in Buellton. Is there a guest house? No, I'm kidding. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's a cot. <laughs> yeah, it's a cot. So how many acres under Vine now? So we work on a, a unique model. Work uh, we work with a, a wide variety of really talented growers yeah. uh, throughout the valley, you know, all the way from Santa Rita Hills in the west all the way to Pappy Canyon in the east. And if you looked at it from an acreage perspective, we're working with about 40 acres right now. Really? So, But that split, a lot of them are very small parcels where we might have an acre in one vineyard and a couple acres in another. And typically, you're, they're not your properties, right? They're not a state Right. We don't, know, we don't own any vineyards. Okay. So yeah. you're out there managing and talking to the wine grower, how we're going to do this, what we're looking for. And you mentioned briefly that um, there's an interesting comment. I don't know if it applies here. You said that you, you paid extra for organic farming and where was that at so it's at a number of the vineyards that we work at john sebastiano would be a good example of that where we have a section in the vineyard that's dedicated towards our style of farming on a pure tonnage basis you just pay more because it costs more oh without a doubt yeah Yeah. no i mean we probably pay more for our fruit than almost anybody else in the valley well it shows Uh, them i mean it shows them the wines the wines i was fascinated by them we featured a couple of them already and i have some in the cellar still but um i mean i'll start in the vineyard we all know this but part of the conversation that I've been having about the biodynamic and organic movement. Organic's a little simpler, a little easier. Uh, you, I see a lot of wines that say made with organic fruit, you know, which means that the fruit's organic, but not necessarily the process is organic. And biodynamic takes it to the next level. And then you talked about how the sustainable is not sustainable. Uh, you know, I mean, biodynamic's not sustainable necessarily. But I have not had a chance, I have had a chance briefly, not briefly, one time to actually taste a wine that was organic, it wasn't biodynamic, farmed across the street from the same winery, and this was conventional. And you, when you heard on Ambeth how, which is fascinating yeah. conversation, we'll talk about that. And they were different, the, the two wines were different, same barrels, same winemaker, just conventional versus organic, they were different. But they weren't extraordinarily different, but there was clearly a difference, not one better than the other. So your, your philosophy on organic is to produce a wine of? Well, it really starts, it starts at the personal level. I mean, because you'll notice if you look at our bottles, they don't say organic or we have the Duvarita Chardonnay. that's not Chardonnay. uncommon, by the way. It's not uncommon. No, I mean, and, and part of that is from where we were inspired. I mean, you look at Anclade Lefleve, uh, rest in peace. You know, she did trials for years conventional organic and then biodynamic side-by-side trials so there's people who came before us who've done these things that we we did people who we really respect as producers who came away with a takeaway that after trials they saw a qualitative difference mm-hmm. so we do believe that there is a qualitative edge but honestly it, it starts at a far more personal level you know where you just look at how we live our life and what we eat and we're so fortunate i mean all of us living within southern california i mean to yeah, be able to get sure. the produce that we get and where we are in the valley to have you know, organic farmers that are, are right next door. And a lot of it is an overarching philosophy where even if it didn't improve the wine quality, if it in, improves soil health, if it improves the water quality in the aquifer, if it, in, if it doesn't impinge on vineyard workers' health as much. I mean, there's so many layers of, of things that I think it may take time, it may take decades for people to realize the full level of insanity of you know, full chemical conventional farming. 
but I think well, that we are slowly but surely getting there. You look at Dan Barber's third plate, which you reference, and you read that, and it's, it's, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> and having seen that, having worked with organic wheat and non-organic wheat as a baker, and I mean, you, yeah. you, you see some of these things where the nutritional value in our food as a culture, if you look at it globally, has plummeted over the years. For sure. And a lot of those things are purely related back to the farming techniques. So uh, you, you listen to the Ambeth, a uh, great conversation with Garrett, and what a, I mean, you're talking about not only biodynamic, you're talking about rustic, right? The, yeah. the really rustic wines. And my daughter, who's the baker, who experienced the same that you did, she mills her own wheat. The chef wanted, you know, she's been through all that, and she's a proponent of it. She brought home a biodynamic rosé the other day from a Silver Lake, you know, a hipster store. It was undrinkable. I mean, it was really, I mean, the volatile acid was tar- horrible. She agreed with me. And I said, you know, just because it's biodynamic or natural, if you want to, if there's a term like that, you know, you have to be able to drink it. Right? Doesn't it doesn't give you license to make a wine that's just not pleasant, you know, in my opinion. Maybe you don't agree with me, but I want to be able to have an ethereal experience. I want to be able to taste the soil. I get that part, right? Amen. And that's, well, I think we're in the early days of really the way that organics and biodynamics apply. So kind of backing up to the farming side and, the, and then when you try to merge that with winemaking, the the laws for biodynamic wine in the UK are actually different than for biodynamic wine in the US. Same with the rules for organic and organic wine. Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, from a, there's the, the legal perspective is different. And so there's a, a wide variety of differences that can come under the same label. Then there's the philosophical things when you start getting into the natural wine camp where you basically have, and I don't, I don't personally take a, a strong position one way or the other because some of my favorite wines on the planet would be considered natural wines. Yeah. Uh, but some of my favorite wines on the planet would be vilified by the yeah. natural wine community. <laughs> and I think that it's, I, I look at it like something like, I think and maybe it's because I've actually been, like you've been around the block a couple of times yeah. that at this point in time, there's so much dogma and so much style overriding any sort of sense of quality or any sort of sense of purity within the wine yep, right now. For sure. That I think if we, we, this will be a very different conversation in five or 10 years. And I think that as the natural wine category actually sort of comes into some sort of a level of, I don't know, maturity may be the right word for it. Hopefully what will happen is style and dogma will become less of the driving influence and the idea of actually discussing quality within the community will start to take hold. Because I think that's one thing that think really a, hasn't been a big focus. It, it can take it in so many directions, but um, it's, uh, one side of the spectrum is the conversation that Garrett says, you know, my our vineyard is, and if you talk to Piero and Senza from Patagonia, he's like, my li- my vineyard's alive now. The armadillos are back and the ants and the whole the whole ecostructure is there. And that's what Garrett talks about. And he says across the street is one of the, you know, hand manicured, and it looks like there's something wrong with it. And I kind of understand that, right? Yeah. You see this sort of bush vines and weeds and, you know, mustard plants and then you see nothing and it's all perfectly manicured and i can see that kind of feels foreign now right i get that part right but to be so rustic you know uh, what did molly hill say she said something like even farming in itself is unnatural right because if you really want to be natural you shouldn't have planted the grape in the first place you should have been there before we got there right well, so, the, 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 you know, that's like the, the, it's a very simple <laughs> slope here, and we could have a very contentious conversation. But I think if you really look at it, if you wanted to make a, a true definition of, uh, I mean, a natural the idea. The, natural. I think the word natural is something that hopefully might leave the conversation at some point it in the should. future. Either. I mean, I, I like the word raw better when you look yeah. at what Isabel's done with raw fare because yeah. there is a set of intent, and in farming, by definition, it's a culture, it's not nature. Yes. And right. it's our sure. job to try to introduce nature into the culture in a way that benefits, whether it's the environment, like we're passionate about, whether it's the quality of the farming, which we're also passionate about. I mean, I, I love that idea where you bring life to the vineyard, and that really yeah. is something that, I think that's valid. without a doubt, is there. And then that's sure. that's that's a fundamental for me. I mean, I think it's really important. And I think when you look at it and you go to these vineyards, you could walk through a, a neighboring vineyard where it's a full conventional regime and not hear a single insect not yeah. see a bird or, no. or not and, and that, that's disturbing that and, and disturbing. so there is something where that that vitality comes through and we hope that you see that vitality in the wine as well but see if you think about and i grew up in this business stocking the shelves of stuff and if you went to napa in those days like my dad truck took me up in a station wagon in the 70s to pick up antique wine fruit presses which you see scattered around the property here i dragged those down from <laughs> from napa but if you see those manicured vineyards, you 
I have a different view of them now based on the conversation with Garrett and this idea that uh, in, in reading Dan Barber's book, you know, where you can tell that the soil is short of some kind of nutrient because that kind of weed is growing, but down the other side, uh, there's different weeds growing, which means there's different things going on, right? Exactly, and I think that's something that, you know, we've tried to actually bring that conversation through to a number of our growers, because I think particularly if you're, like many vineyard owners in California, are oftentimes either absentee owners or growers who are not necessarily producing wine, and if you're used to having a property where you have a nice garden or you have a a lawn that's manicured, Mm -hmm. the level of quality is oftentimes measured by how pristine it looks. But if you go (laughs) walk through a forest, that also looks pristine in its own different way, but there is much more nature, there's much more dynamism, there's much more chaos. And that's the thing that I think it's important to look at within vineyards is that, you know, what's your objective? Are you growing something that's a, a, you know, a bonsai orchard manicured garden that's something that's a, you know, like your English garden to just, just walk the dog in? Or are you growing fruit that can produce world-class wine? And sometimes they can have mutual objectives. And again, I'm not throwing anyone totally under the bus. No. But I think that it's important. We always try to educate people to, to say that you know we're growing wine, we're not growing vines. Right. And it's th- th- those things obviously relate. That sounds a little bit philosophical, but the difference is is that having a manicured vine row that you have a machine run down that hedges it so that it looks completely uniform while that might look nice to a tourist driving across the road you know for me that's actually that's not what we want to see we want to see vitality we want to see vibrancy we're happy to see weeds under vine as long as they're not getting into the fruit zone because it means that there's something else growing and i think that in in time we're going to look back on this era in, uh, with a completely different set of eyes. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, glyphosate, Roundup will be banned at some point. I'm 100% convinced of that. Well, and it's interesting because uh, what many wine, especially the Europeans, are like, well, my kids are running around that yard. You know, they're out there playing around the vineyard. I don't want them to put their hand in the dirt and get all kinds of pesticides. Yeah. Right? So I think that's a really valid point. It's a very valid point. But when it comes, when, for me, and I wrote, there's, I wrote an article, I wrote, I'm writing another one now, but I wrote one on LinkedIn. It was about natural wine. It was more a practical approach because, you know, there's no, there's not even an FDA um, definition for natural food. You can put natural on your bagel bag uh, as long as uh, the, it's assumed that there's nothing in those bagels that shouldn't be there. That's all it means. Yeah. There's a natural flavoring definition and a requirement in artificial, but not natural, not natural wine for sure, but natural food doesn't even really exist. So I, that, I make that argument in this thing, and we, I kind of, conclude with the fact that the least amount of intervention on the winemaker's part and the grower's part would constitute whether it's natural or not. That's kind of the way I summed it up. But but at the end game, the end game is to open a bottle of Dragon at Pinot and have an experience that uh, takes you away from what you're doing and makes you feel what the winemaker was trying to do. And that's the connection to the soil, in my opinion, and why wine is a different beverage, an ethereal beverage than any other beverage, even though it's of the soil, it's ethereal. You, I have to think, like when I tell the story all the time, but when I go home, my wife says, I'd like a glass of wine. I have to think about what I'm going to pour her because I got to understand her mood and what we're having for dinner and all kinds of little pieces to decide for the other night. And I admitted this to her yesterday. She wanted. She she loves Bordeaux varietals anyway, so I knew that. But I did not feel like that. <laughs> I want <laughs> I want to drag an at Pinot Noir, right? It's I opened her the 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 because I knew she would enjoy this Lafitte uh, cab from Argentina, Caro, it's called. And I was just kind of oh man, but I really feel like a Pinot, and so that that kind of feeling for I want everybody to feel something like that. I don't want people to say, "Give me a glass of wine." Yeah, wine should actually be an emotional experience. It should be an emotional experience. And it should be something that it's such a unique thing because it's one of the few things, I mean, maybe the only thing on earth that can capture both time and place. Right. In a way that, like, I love the word that you use, the ethereal. I mean, that really brings in a whole other dimension. Well, I had um, Juliana, she's on the podcast, Juliana de Cuia, she, her uncle owns two wineries, one called Fin de Mundo in Argentina, I think it's in Patagonia, and the other is in Armenia, which is a new up-and-coming appellation. And she said, and, I, and winemakers have loved this comment, what other product in the world can you manufacture and take with you that so well represents where it's from? That's absolutely Across true. Across the country. So you can yeah. take your, the Dragon and Chardonnay, you can take it to Armenia, you can take it to France and say, this is what we're about. And it's intact that way. You absolutely. can't do that with a widget. No, you can't. Or a wilted <laughs> radish, right? No, I mean, a photograph is really one of the few things that comes yeah. close to that, but you can't experience that. I mean, can't experience food it. and wine enter your body. I mean, so it's a whole different cycle. So we have, we, and the, the idea of experience that you're talking about, which is so important because um, 
I have texts regularly, and I've told this story a few times, but I have texts regularly from people in Italy or in France, and they're at a brasserie or they're at the Trattoria, and they take a picture of the label, and they go, can you get me this? And I get it for them. Same vintage, same grave, everything's the same. And they pick it up from here, then they take it home, and they go, it's not the same. I go, it's not the same, not because of the wine. It's the same wine. You're just not in front of the Parthenon or in front of the Eiffel Tower, you know, having a glass of wine. That's the difference, right? It's Absolutely. not a full experience. It's set and setting. It's the whole context. It's the, yeah, it's it's the experience. It's how it's element. happening. And so, yeah, when you're in a great mood in a great place, you know, wine's yeah, going to taste better. The kids aren't pulling on your shirt tail. <laughs> <laughs> we want to we get out of here. Uh, but you mentioned something earlier when we first started talking, and that was about the food and wine thing. Um, and you went to Italy to experience this, and you determined that. And w- what part of Italy were you in? I was in the Marche region. Yeah. yeah. And so you found the food, the synergy between the food and the wine. That was new to me. Yeah, because kind of at the era that I grew up, I mean, it was sort of more meat and potatoes in America. And for me, it was just what I loved about that was that the food that we were eating, the wine that we were drinking, was really defined by the landscape. And that's a, that's something that has I mean, it really had hit home then, and it's really grown over the years. But when you think about that. Every one of us every day has the chance to actually create the landscape that we want to be a part of. And, and by choosing great wine, by choosing food that's grown consciously, you're in, you're not only influencing your own health, which I think is extremely important, and yep. luckily more and more people are thinking about that every day, but those are also changes in how the countryside is going to look like. And when you look at it, you know we're sitting down in the greater Los Angeles area right now, and that the area down here has the ability to radically reshape the way that coastal California looks, you know, from here to San Francisco. For sure, for sure. And I think that that's it's a pretty special thing to be part of that and to think yeah. about that that you know you're really voting with your dollars every time you buy a bottle of wine. Yeah. And that <laughs> no, no, literally. I mean, I, I mean like this that. very seriously. That that's you know, are you supporting something that's that kind of you know crazy monoculture that you see along the five, or are you supporting something? You know, that's going to employ a number of small families. And when you take your next trip up to Santa Barbara, see this incredibly bucolic countryside scene. You know, again, it's wine is agriculture. And oftentimes in the urban areas, we don't always think about that. But it's such a magical thing that you have that connection. It's and a, we can all support and it. And that's, I think that part of the movement, this is sort of this, that's part of the sustainable movement, right? I mean, if you're pinpointed to somebody, something we're doing in this business, uh, sustainable would be that definition where you are in, uh, witnessing and watching and concerned about the environment that you're working in and the wages you're paying and the people you're paying and where they're coming from. I think that's all part of that, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you think? What do you think the direction of Dragon It is now? What What's your next horizon that you want to? Uh, you're gonna go after biodynamic farming. We're gonna. Just- well, we work with uh, vineyards like Duvarita and Grimm's Bluff, which are certified biodynamic. And in the acreage that we're working with in other vineyards, like John Sebastiano is a SIP certified vineyard, our rows within that vineyard are farmed organically. And then we also, we've incorporated the biodynamic techniques that we feel are most relevant to soil health and wine quality. Mm, So it's a little bit difficult to encapsulate this quickly, but we've basically taken the techniques that we feel matter the most and matter the most to us personally and incorporated those within what we do. So even if tomorrow we bought an estate vineyard, I'm not sure whether we would certify as biodynamic. I think we might actually sort of evolve into our own farming techniques. And I think that for the real geeks in here, you should look up regenerative agriculture. I think there's a whole movement in the United States now uh, that's, I think Dan Barber has really sort of helped shine a spotlight on that where you're, you're, you're organic by default because you're not using synthetic um, pesticides or herbicides or fungicides, um, but really taking into account what's happening below the ground as much as you are above the ground. Because it's one thing to just think about, you know, what you're spraying in a vineyard, you know, which yeah. is the common thing. Sure. Um, but to really think about, you know, what's happening nutritionally in the soil, what's happening with all the fungal matter within the soil, what's happening with the life within the soil, for lack yeah. of a better word. So for us on the farming side, it's really digging deeper and deeper into that angle regardless of any sort of a, a certification process it's more about what can we do so we're, we're starting to look at things now where under the undervine area we're going to really geek out here but the undervine area in terms of how that's managed in a vineyard that's oftentimes one of the big sticking points for organic because again you can spray roundup once or twice a year and quote unquote save yeah, money of course right. if you're <laughs> like that's getting true, people though. cancer that's, that's right. a whole I've different thing but um, <laughs> the undervine area is a challenging thing to manage so, you know, so we're looking at things like is there a crop that we could plant under the vine that wouldn't grow up high enough to disturb the fruit but right. would grow enough to outcompete the other weeds 
there's just a few people who are experimenting with that in Australia right now that I know of. But I mean, you know, we're trying to look at things like that. So trying to, on the vineyard side, just look forward at the more regenerative techniques. And then for us in the cellar and as a business, I mean, I like to say that where we are now is really refinement. You know, we're not trying to reinvent wheels or trying to jerk the wheel to follow a different trend. In our short period of time, in about 15 years in the San Ynez Valley, we've seen the pendulum swing from one side to the other in terms of wine style. Yeah, for And sure. then right back yeah, in the middle. Happen. And that, that's great. You know, yeah. I think that especially in young dynamic regions like Santa Barbara, I think that you need to push the envelope in all these different directions. And I think that's how you really find what typicity is, is by actually pushing things to the extreme and in, in every potential direction. But for us, you know, we're not out to, you know, we're not driven by a specific style agenda. We like to say that our dogma is to have no dogma. You know, we want to create great wine and work with great vineyards. And so that's obviously a mission and it has been from the very beginning. And we've now had the benefit of having a number of years. There's a number of vineyards that we're working with that were coming into the decade long range in terms of working with those same plots. Yes. And so it really is every single year we're pushed to see what can we do better? What can we do better with the farming? With the ultimate goal of how can we make the wine more delicious, more better, more age worthy? And that's- That's an interesting that's thought because Mark would agree with this. Uh, earlier days, you open a glass of Pinot and you would always reference its Burgundian character. That was kind of the benchmark. Was it, was it Burgundian? Remember we used to say that? You would say, well, it's very Burgundian. And we don't, you don't hear that anymore. Which is fantastic. That's yeah. been a big pet peeve of ours for years. Yeah. Because again, there, there are producers who they hold that reference to be so pinpoint that they literally will co-opt the recipe. We have colleagues, friends of ours, who will literally copy a recipe of what's done in Burgundy and Santa Rita Hills. But to me, that that's pointless. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why, if you want to make Burgundy, go to Burgundy. <laughs> like Particularly Pinot Noir, which without is a doubt. so expressive of where yeah, it's, it's grown. It's so know? expressive. So we should be coaxing. Like that, That's for us. We like to say that our goal is to express the Santa Barbara-ness yeah, or even more absolutely. specifically, the Santa Rita Hills nature, you know, and it's what's so different. Unique. It's so it unique. is unique. And we have these amazing things. We have diatomaceous earth where nowhere else on the planet is growing grapes out of that except Santa Rita Hills. Really? Yeah. You have serpentinite out in Happy Canyon. You have these clay soils with limestone underneath wow, them in wow, Ballard wow. Canyon. So there's that diversity that we have that we want to reflect. And then we want to dig deeper into that. And we want to actually really lean into it and say, what can we coax out of the vineyard that will express something that's completely unique to that area? So this is actually thought going back to your food and wine experience. Uh, it's, it's always apparent to me, f French food, even though the Italians taught them to cook, don't tell them that though, but the French food and the wines that evolved in Bordeaux and Burgundy, the foods of Burgundy are different than the foods of Bordeaux and all over the world, uh, indigenous grapes growing uh, like Umbria, where you get these wonderful whites that are so amazing and you get Sagrantino and the foods go with that, right? Yeah. And there's this culture that's grown together. And I think that's not by, that's by design, it's not by accident. But in America, we don't have that, right? We have, we don't really have indigenous wine grapes. If it is vinifera, we have Concord, and you don't make jam out of it. But so, when I brought that up with Jacques Lardier from from um, Resonance or Louis Jadot, he's like, yeah, but that's what the new world's about. The new world, you have the you have the ability and the culture to create your cuisine from what you're making. And I go, that's a fascinating approach to look at it. Without a doubt. So we have now this California cuisine, which is evolving as well, uh, with wines like the Dragonette wines, and others, of course. But I think that's a fascinating conversation. To, uh, and, and then you talked about the landscape all at the coast, how that's changing. Because one of my biggest problems with food, and maybe we'll become food snobs, I kind of feel like I am. But how is it a tomato? at the bottom of that truck coming down the five freeway you mentioned is still surviving. Why isn't it tomato sauce by now? Because it's a lot of weight. Well, it's been, it's been, 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 been <laughs> easy for you to say, been manipulated yeah. to do that, right? That, that. And, and that's something that I think fortunately we're seeing a renaissance in food in the United States. For sure. And the wine is right on the table at that same movement. And I think that you're, you're, we're starting to see after, we're starting to see the errors of the ways that in the post-war era, that tomato was not bred for flavor. That tomato was bred for shelf life stability. It was bred for longevity. And we're now realizing, like I said earlier, that those same things, they were some, some, some choices that, though they seemed you know, logical at the time, when you look at that tomato that's grown that way, and you look at an heirloom tomato that Finley Farms or Roots Farms grows up in the San Ynez Valley, and you run the nutritional analysis on those things, they're night and day. Are they really? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those heirloom Dan tomatoes that are grown organically, I mean, they're gonna be more nutritious, they're gonna make you feel better, they're gonna keep your health going, they're gonna have more vitamins and more nutrients. And So here's a question that I don't know the answer, and I've argued with my millennial kids about this. 
and, and, not, and not as a devil's advocate, as a devil's advocate, not as taking a position. But so Dan Barber talks about the 40 strains of wheat in America that have all been uh, crossbred to do whatever, right? So there, so the, you crossbred a couple of different wheat strains to withstand whatever, right? Uh, but they do the same thing in the lab now. GMO, or GM would be the same thing except done with DNA in, in a lab. So what is the difference? I and mean, this is, I'm not looking for, uh, if, you, if the answer is unknown, that's fine. But I was asked, I posed this question to my, my daughter. I said, if I'm modifying the, the DNA by crossbreeding and to do something in particular with wheat, how is that different than doing it in a lab? You're going to have to ask a geneticist. Yeah. But my, <laughs> a I, can't, I can't answer that question <laughs> totally authoritatively. Yeah. Um, I believe the difference is that when you're crossbreeding plants, you're essentially, you're taking traits from the two plants and trying to create a third trait, right? Yeah, or something right. that leans in one yeah. direction or the other. You're not, that's not happening at the molecular level. Where with, like you said, with GMO, it's literally happening at the DNA. Yeah. And that makes so sense. You, you know that those two plants that are outgrowing in nature that have their own pe pest and disease relevance, you put two of those things together and create a third thing, it's probably the apple's not going to fall too far from the tree. Right, right, right. Where with GMO, and I actually don't take as much of a hardline position on this. I'm personally anti-GMO, yeah. but I'm not militant about that because yeah. I think that there probably are a lot of really phenomenal things that can be accomplished by that over time. My skepticism with GMO comes with, it's a bit of a Pandora's box that we're opening, and we're not going to be able to see the consequences on this for decades. I agree with that. And I think that particularly for things that we're putting in our body, things that we're eating, for sure. I think that we ought to learn what those consequences are before we actually... When you consider all the products and all the chemicals and all the world that, that now we found cause cancer and those kinds of things, I think you're right. I think yeah, and there's probably going to be you know a, a multitude issues. of wonderful things that GMO can accomplish in, in certain areas, you know, but I think that we should take a generally skeptical approach to it, and we should, or if not skepticism, at least caution should be exercised. How are the farmer's markets in, in Santa Barbara? The farmer's markets are unbelievable. I mean, it's really, we're so spoiled out here. It's one of the things that in Santa Barbara, you can go to farmer's market almost every day of the week, depending on where you are. There's yeah, they're one real in Santa farm, Barbara, Goleta. real flavorful. The, all, all real farms, all... <clears throat> absolutely you know <clears throat> pardon me they're all local and so they all have to come within a certain radius and you can find just utterly amazing produce year round and that's one of the uh, things that's the most special thing about the area for the, us there's one in santa monica and it's the wednesdays is sort of the chef day and the other is on saturdays which is more for the public and i've posed this question quite a bit and i posed it to joaquin Spichel recently i said okay i'm, I'm going to go to the market i'm going to go to ralph's i'm going to go to the conventional section and I'm gonna pick a bunch of tomatoes and things, and you're gonna go to the farmer's market and pick the same exact species, and we're gonna make the same dish in the same kitchen with the same temperatures and the same service, and which one's gonna taste better? And That's, he he categorically said, of course, the, the organic ones. Okay. And so it leads to like the conversation about, well, we've had organic things that didn't taste so great. And so it goes back to the certification, and we we're talking about the label, you don't have it on your label. Um, Bodega Chakra or Biodynamic Farm in Argentina, he does not put any of these things on his label either. So I'm headed towards this idea that the practices, it may, it's just as important and I think less important that you stick the brand on the, the, the certification on the back of the label than that you actually are practicing these things. And I'm right, but that's the value of certification and this may sound hypocritical since we don't have it on our labels, but what I'll say with this is the value of certification is that it proves your honesty. And we've been through this. So with Duvarita Vineyard, that vineyard is certified biodynamic and we're making a small amount of rind for Brick and Corey Williams, the owners. And their wine that's made in our cellar is now going to be certified biodynamic. So we went through the biodynamic certification process for our own facility. So it was fascinating to see that because through that audit, we found that our own standard practices fit, they tick every box for the biodynamic thing. Now, we personally don't see the value in paying several thousand dollars to go through that certification yeah. process for one or two wines within our lineup. So, you know, we're not doing that. But the value of seeing the USDA organic label or the Demeter biodynamic label is you know that that person is actually doing what they say they're doing in the vineyard. And that's, that's one thing that I think you can echo it out. And I don't want to spend too much time talking negatively, but within the natural wine community, there's quote unquote natural wine producers from Santa Barbara who are buying wines from some of the most convention, buying grapes from some of the most conventionally farmed vineyards in the valley, yeah. and then showing them to somebody in Los Angeles, and just because it's cloudy and it's fizzy, they think it's natural. Yeah. Where to me, the fundamental thing, if you're really gonna get into natural or raw, certified biodynamic or organic grapes need to be your starting point. 
Otherwise, it's it, I, I, to me that's for fraudulent. sure. Uh, well, yes. If, if I think you're right, the certification is going to potentially and hopefully you know weed out the charlatans. But let's just say we're honest farmers, and we we do what we say we're going to do. And I think because I I see a lot of wines that come through is Are you organically certified? No, but we practice organic farming. Which are is you great. By, we practice biodynamic farming? Uh, there's a winery in, on Sardinia that makes Sangiovese. It's uh, it it has it's not long lived. I just opened a bottle of thirteen and it was it's failing, but it, it's it, on release is gorgeous, and it's it, he was talking about how expensive. There's like a team of guys, for instance, and this guy is responsible for this row, and he kind of knows each vine uh, by personality yeah. and what it needs, right? And so these wines were gorgeous wines, and they're not inexpensive. It costs a lot of money to do that because you have to have so many people in the vineyard doing it. But they, it wasn't. It, they're not extraordinarily long lived either. Uh, and I'm not sure I brought that up, except that I want to add to this. He plays Bach during the certain parts of the season. I've heard about this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they they literally did a study where they put Bose did this, put uh, rock music in one part of the vineyard and um, Bach in another part, and the <laughs> the vines grew away from the rock music and they grew toward the, the Bach. Okay? That's so, fascinating. <laughs> and, and I, I mean, if if they did the study and that's the way it came out, I, I'm not going to argue with it, but wow, how interesting, right? I mean, really interesting. Well, We like our vines to hear songbirds and the wind of the Santa Rita Hills. Yeah, right. And, I believe that. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's this is we could go on forever and ever you and I. I'd love to have you back. No, we we, we I, could. There's yeah, there's a lot to talk about that with it. But I think that you know for us the the overarching philosophy with it is that the you know the wine in the bottle should be a great representation of both you know where we're from, where the vines are grown, and the vintage that it comes from. And so to that end, you know we really we we want to lean into the vintage. We want to lean into the specific appellations that we're working with, and really. Santa Barbara's a really special place showcase and those. we want to showcase that as the best we can so the last question is going to be so we can wrap this up for you I know you got to get on but you worked at Wally's uh, you knew probably through all the people that came through there that it's very hard to make money on the, on your side of the fence now making wine is not a, a necessarily profitable venture I see it every day here um, and particularly now uh, and, there are a bunch of clubs. The congestion of my direct-to-consumer level is huge. I mean, it's just right. I just saw two new ones the other day on the web. I was like, what are you thinking? I mean, really, seriously, you think there's room for two more? Particularly when there's these Groupon guys that are selling 15 bottles for $45. You get a free corkscrew, and they're bringing in 50,000-gallon bladders of very bad wine uh, that equate to less than a euro a bottle for a liter. And, you know, they're bottling in a bunch of brands. And what's that's done is it's forced... Um, a lot of supply to open up from regular conventional winemakers here. So the, my tasting room was flooded with samples from all over the country and all over the world uh, that are not distressed, but they need to move them, including samples from my competitors, which is the most bizarre thing that I think I've ever been through in the last 30 years I've been doing this. My competitors send me samples where they have 10,000 bottles of overstock or cases. So it's... so. How and your brand is gorgeous. The wines are wonderful. They express what you just brought to us. Why did you start this thing? Why did you think that this was going to be a good idea? <laughs> well, for us, <laughs> for us, it has been and is. You know, it's it's always been driven by passion for wine, passion for the land, passion for the farming, and not just for wine, but for trying to achieve greatness in wine. You yeah. know, something where you have those, like you said, those emotional, those sort of ethereal experiences with a bottle. And so we were driven, and in some ways you could say that's naive. You know, none of us came from a business background. Yeah. And we really saw that there was an opportunity in Santa Barbara, that it was a place that's, you know, a young region that's growing, still places to be discovered. You know, we've been part of pioneering vineyards in different soil types or different regions within the subregions of the San Inez Valley. And for us, it was really about just having that mission of you know, being part of the process, being hands-on both within the vineyard and within the cellar, and creating something that's great and you're right that it is a business <laughs> and so fortunately you know we had the if you build it they will come model and yeah. that worked out very well for us um but for for you know for us we've never taken anything for granted and so yeah. we got into it knowing that it would be a lot of you know years of very incredible hard work 
And, you know, the famous saying in the wine industry, you know, how do you make a small fortune in wine? <laughs> you start with a large one. Right. You, you know, said when, it, I didn't say it. <laughs> we, when we were making $12 an hour working retail, like we didn't have a large fortune. Yeah, that's so true. We had to, to be very intelligent about it and to start very small. And I know it's a little bit of a, a, a buzzword, but I mean, we did grow very organically just in terms of the business as well. You know, so we started with a few hundred cases and now we shoot for five or 6,000 cases, but we kept it intentionally small so that we can focus on the Good. quality, not the quantity. And I think that's been something that's been key. And truthfully, you know, who knows whether somebody could do what we did starting today as opposed to starting 15 years ago. Because that's again, true. things are more and more saturated. Big difference. And Big you know, difference. we look at it, we think one of the great things about Santa Barbara is that there's such a, a great element of community where for us, another winery, you know, Jessica Gaska, who was our director of hospitality for four years, she started her own label, Story of Soil. We encourage that. Yeah. You know, we like the idea that somebody who's working with us has just as much passion and, and that drive to go do it themselves. And we think that it's, you know, we, we, what I'm trying to say is that we, we view other wineries who are passionately creating really great wines as comrades and as colleagues and as friends rather than as competitors. For sure. And again, you know, there are bottlenecks within the supply chain and obviously you're in a position where hopefully it's an advantage for you where you have, you're spoiled for choice. But I think that over time, the wine industry, we're already seeing Santa Barbara even start to segment a little bit where, you know, there's people who are just, okay, let's focus on the value side of the equation. You know, other people who are, let's focus on the quality side of the equation like we're doing. Well, there's a and, huge... Well, first of all, I have to talk to my father because I only got three fifty an hour at my dad's wine shop. <laughs> uh, and just for for fun, I had Bruce Nyer in here from Napa, and he he and I were talking. And he used to sell to my father when he was at Joseph Phelps in the '60s and '70s. And he said, "When I came, he goes, my job was a sales manager job." And he's talking about like '71, '72. He goes, "So the sales manager at Joseph Phelps back then, what you did was you got your station wagon, you filled it with wine, and you drove to L.A. and you went to five places." That was he our went, business model yeah. back in 2004 and 5. Right. You went to Palace Breeze Wines and Spirits, my dad's store. You went to Wally's. Uh, you went to uh, the Duke of Bourbon. And I think a couple others that probably Mark remembers. And, that, and you drove home. That was the sales manager's job. And those were the five stores that were pertinent in the 70s for, for this business. But really, congratulations on, on pursuing that dream and making it work and producing such high-quality product and helping educate the consumer on what, you know, real wine is about, and like we said, the ethereal aspect of wine. It's really, really fun to to witness and to see. And I love the wines, and we'll bring some in to to have available for the customers that listen to this. And uh, I hope I see you again. Yeah, well, th you know, absolutely, it'd be fun to continue to carry, some more, carry yeah. on the conversation. Yeah. And thanks for doing what you're doing. I think it's really, it's great. That with, you know, podcasting is now such a great way to get the word out. And I even have my friends listen to my friends. I thought would never listen to this, and and I throw them <laughs> under the bus because they they have sellers and they're full of Napa cabs. That's the, and they're just beginning their trek. And I, I mentioned this on a, on a podcast, I heard that. <laughs> and they called me from ta on the way to Tile. Hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> so anyway, but uh, well, that's great. Expand wines. the horizons, and there's a, there's a, a lot of great wine out there for and people. Good to luck explore. with the MW. I hope the, the practical. I know this, four years is pretty quick, so uh, you did a good job. Fing well, fingers are crossed. I mean, I'm not there yet. Yeah, it's well, a long journey, sorry. but yeah. And good luck Take to you with it. I think it's a, it's a fantastic you. journey, and I and encourage anybody who's seriously thinking about it to get in touch with somebody who's in it because it is a, a phenomenal community and. I think that you know, we all have in, in a way kind of a duty to, to keep sharing that passion, and I, I think that that's a great when way get, to do when it. When I finish this rock book, I'll call you. Please do. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Nice Cheers. seeing you.